Okay. Okay, hello we and Recording welcome. Welcome, Dr. Jan Eichhorn. Welcome, Finn Klebe. I'm very happy to welcome you on this very special talk. Um, the format is um, not really new. I, I like to invite people to my seminars, but I do really like to invite real people to real seminars and not virtual people to virtual seminars. So this is kind of new. We are um, going to see how this works. Um, we will record this interview, not interview, this kind of talk. Um, and uh, students in our um, uh, introduction to social sciences module, first year students that are now going through their second uh, semester, that have learned a lot about uh, sociology, about media science, about political science, um, who have gotten uh, acquainted with the basic concepts of the disciplines, who have uh, read one or the other book, who uh, textbook or even some have gotten really into theory, a lot of articles. Um, um, some even have done some research or media projects, but uh, what we um, do not have is any kind of idea of what it actually means to, to do sociology, to do social sciences, to be a political science scientist. And I think that's very important. And I think an introduction to social sciences should always also be an introduction what it means to do that, what it, what it means to be a social scientist. And um, for that, there's nothing as good and interesting as real people who talk about their real life experience. We have done covered some uh, of what it means to do sociology. In the specific case, we've looked into the practice of participant observation and of other uh, methods. And Finn remembers that when you were uh, in that same seminar two years ago, three years ago. I don't remember. What is it? Three years ago. Three years ago. Uh, we already had a bit of that, uh, but I have actually expanded on that and made it an explicit part of the seminar because I think it's really important. Now, I don't believe that people develop a perspective of here's what I'm going to do in my life and then work out a plan and this is how I'll go about it and this is step by step down that path. There are some people who live like that, but in general, I think the rule is more similar to what John Lennon famously said, famously said and that is that life is something that happens to people busy making plans. So we do develop plans and ideas of what we'd like to do, but then something happens and we go down other paths. And then the more and more we, the, as we grow old, here's a bit of a sad message, uh, the less and less chances we have because path dependency is one of the strongest factors uh, that predict our, our future paths. And the longer the path behind us, the stronger the predictor, which means when you're old, you don't have much of a choice. Good news, you're young, you have a lot of choices, even you, Jan, uh, especially you, Finn, um, and even more the, the people who will be listening to this video and, and uh, watching this video and, and the, who have basically all doors open. It really doesn't matter, this is an important thing, which social science study program you join, as long as you start off somewhere in the social sciences, you can get to basically any point, end point, uh, whether that's in academia or in business or in NGOs uh, that you're looking for, aiming for, dreaming of, that you have a vague idea of going for. But I think the most important thing we can do uh, is provide you with an idea of what you will be dealing with. And that's what we'll do today. What does it mean to be a social scientist? What does doing social science mean as a life practice? What kind of a life are you having, Jan? And uh, I will not introduce you. I will first ask uh, Finn to introduce himself as kind of more the interviewer. And then we will ask you to introduce yourself as the interviewee. But as I said, this is not an interview. This is a kind of a talk situation. So we're just having a chat. Finn, maybe you start with who you are where life took you so far. 
All right. So my name is Finn. Um, Finn Kleve. I'm uh, originally from Flensburg, Germany, where I'm also uh, um, currently located because of the coronavirus, obviously, that affects us all. Um, I graduated from ISS last year in 2019. Um, we were the last ones to have a proper graduation, so to speak, <laughs> um, at Strandlos, which I think went now bankrupt, as well as our beautiful sports hall. I, I still hope that you all uh, get to enjoy graduation somehow or that there's some replacement. But anyways, um, after Jakobs, I went to um, Oxford to do my master's in global governance and diplomacy, um, which is pretty much a continuation of ISS, I would say. I think um, in the beginning, I thought it would be more even leaning in the IR direction, but now it's really, um, it has gotten, especially through my focus on social movements and contentious politics, it has really, uh, again, kind of entailed a lot of different disciplines um, with sociology, communication science, political science, IR a little bit. Um, but yeah, really that plethora of different disciplines, I think, has um, followed me throughout my studies and now also at Oxford still, um, which I enjoy a lot. And I think I've really learned that uh, through ISS and yeah, maybe so far uh, from my side. And so you'll be very curious to hear from Jan, who will introduce himself now. Yes. Jan, can you hear us? Yep, yep, absolutely. I'm sorry, there was just, I think, some, some feedback uh, in there. Um, yep, I'm uh, Jan Eichon. I'm uh, um, Jakobs University graduate from 2009, um, where uh, I graduated from, from ISS, so the sixth year of Jakobs students, the sixth graduating class. Um, I then went on to the University of Edinburgh, and what Jakob just said um, absolutely holds true for me because I had the plan to do a PhD in um, sociology, a kind of at the intersection between economics, politics, and sociology, so very ISS focused, um, focused on the impact of um, labor market policy, in particular unemployment policy, on uh, people's well being and happiness um, to challenge economic assumptions. Um, so there, it sounds very Jacobs to me, very mixed in uh, with things. Um, but when I went uh, to Edinburgh to do my PhD, my, I um, said very clearly, I will only stay there for three years. And I said, I never want to become an academic and work at a university. Um, and now I'm a senior lecturer in social policy at the University of Edinburgh. And I um, teach um, uh, classes on economic governance, economic policy, public policy. Um, I do research in this field. Um, and um, I also, however, work with a think tank in Berlin that I co-founded um, partially with some other Jacobs alumni in a more applied way. So there is something a bit applied. But actually, I ended up quite deep in academia in the social sciences, um, and I think that's partially thanks to Jakob. So I would agree with Jakob entirely. There are path dependencies, but you never know um, where they take you in the first place. That's um, such an empowering thought for a young person. The problem is, once you grow older, you <laughs> carry more and more of a load of, oh, that's the path I've gone down <laughs> with you. But that has time until you turn 40, let's say. <laughs> I'm, I'm so, feeling it so, already a little bit, I must say. It's, there, is, there, is, um, there, there are moments you, you start, you're absolutely right, because there's this interesting world. I mean, Jacobs, in a sense, has this, ISS or SMP, have this nice, and I think, really, really valuable approach of thinking about real societal, political, and economic problems, but not from a monodisciplinary perspective, right? You integrate ideas from different disciplines to really think about. Like, what can I learn from all of these approaches to get into this problem? This is not how most of academia is organized, however, and actually a lot of public policy is organized. Um, so you see academia, obviously, often with very disciplinary foci, which is why I'm really glad to be in a department called social policy that's staffed with political scientists, sociologists, historians. So it's I feel very much at home there. I felt less at home when I was in a pure sociology department, for example. I found that more difficult because I didn't feel I fit um, into as narrow a box. And interestingly, it, it also applies to public policy. So it's really interesting when you talk to policymakers and you discuss labor market policy, the, the instinct that often happens is, well, we need to talk to economists about this. And that makes sense to some extent, but there are lots of people who obviously work on labor market policy from very different perspectives. And for example, the lived experience of people, um, which economists might not be as good as um, exploring, for example. So 
there's something really, really interesting there that, that relates to this, something I had to learn. And the longer you stay in one discipline, the, the more you get boxed into that discipline as well. So it's actually mm -hmm. something that, that I've noticed already, definitely. Uh, let me give give you a really tough question, and then I'll then I'll leave the f floor to 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 Finn to to torture you with questions. But it's it's a heavy one. Uh, was it mean to you to be a social scientist? Was it mean? Yeah, in, that's in your life. Sense? That's your life. Yeah. So I don't know how many hours does the day have. Twenty four. How many hours of that day are you active as a social scientist? How many of those hours are you preparing to be active again as a social scientist? It's a central part of your life. So if mm -hmm. you think about yeah, it, why Probably are you a social scientist? I mean, okay, there's part of it, it happened. But if you look at your personality, at your wishes, your dreams, your preferences, what you like, what you're interested, what makes you tick, what makes you a social scientist? That's a very good question. And um, it's actually a conversation I have with, with my partner, who's also an academic and, and uh, colleagues. Uh, it's when does work stop as a social scientist? So if I read a book that I'm really interested in, but that's in the field, is that work or is that fun? Um, and it starts there. And actually, a lot of the conversation, I'm not saying I'm someone who works all the time. I probably switch off when I cook. But otherwise, I would probably say I'm a social scientist about 13 to 14 hours a day. And even when I cook, I think about the social implications of the things I cook. It's, it's kind of, it's really nerve wracking um, in, in a sense, because it's, it's hard to stop thinking about the things you're passionate about if they affect everything you're doing. You know, even your, your kind of shop, the choices you make in a supermarket sounds a bit pretentious maybe, but it's. But if you think about these things professionally, it's very hard to say, oh, now I'm a private person and now it goes all out of the window. It's actually, but that is why I ended up with the social sciences. So until I was 16, actually, I wanted to study physics. I had a clear plan, actually. I, I wanted to be an experimental physicist who works at a particle accelerator um, and um, you know, works on those sorts of things. Very, very clear path. My parents were very happy with it. And then at the end of my high school, I told them I want to apply to study integrated social sciences at a small private university in Bremen. And my parents looked at me puzzled. Um, but the reason I think why I wanted to do it was because I was really interested in the approach of having research and teaching, because I was intrigued about research. That was something I wanted. I wanted to understand things, explore things. But at the same time, I was very interested in social change. So I was active in student representation work, student politics, those sorts of things. And I think that's where the two things came together for me. Actually, the kind of the research, the empirical work, with that sort of social science mission. And that's kind of what stuck with me till today. So I do my job at the University of Edinburgh, but actually through, I, I like to bring research outside of academia. So the academic setting is great and I really like teaching. But what I then like to do is use that research externally. Um, and I think about kind of what does this mean? How can we improve them for politics, political engagement? It's why I set up this think tank in Berlin with a few others, where we do exactly this. We take research and try to apply it. So in a sense, I guess I'm a social scientist most of the time in a weird way. But that is, that is stressful, I, I would say. It's not... It's you constantly reflect on things, and that can be a bit depressing at times, especially when things aren't going well in the world around you. There's so much I want to say, but I really think it's more important for me to shut up and and give Finn a chance to ask. You must have tons of questions. You can also ask que practical questions, whatever interests you. Here's your future self. If you had a time machine and could come back and ask yourself questions, your future self, here's your chance. Go for right. it. I would, I would maybe, uh, because of, uh, Jan, what you said, I think that I can really much relate to that. I'll maybe uh, share one experience as well um, with practical relevance and of, of research, and then we'll ask a question, because I think it's quite relevant, especially um, today in our current situation. Um, there is a project that I'm working on, actually, and I have never worked on anything like that before. It's called the Oxford Government um, COVID Government Response Tracker. And basically, the idea was, and that really goes back to um, having relevance with research or having relevance with uh, things you find out in the social sciences, 
was kind of the idea that um, governments all around the world were um, shutting down countries, were putting in more and more restrictions, and nobody was really keeping track of it, right? Um, and then there was a, a researcher from the Blavatnik School, also public policy school, actually at Oxford, and said, we have to somehow keep track of that. We have to put it in a database. We have to code it. And I think um, you, you're probably uh, now doing that for some classes as well, maybe for your research methods. And you're always thinking like, what, what does that really do? Why do we have to code stuff? Why do we like have to do those nuisance things maybe or, or tiring things kind of? But if you really look at the database that has now grown over the last two months, um, and the government response tracker, um, it has really an impact on the world because we have kept track of all those policies and now have uh, addressed a lot of policymakers. It has created so much buzz. I think the uh, data of the database is downloaded. It's freely available for everyone. It's downloaded around 500 times a day. Um, there, just one, one funny anecdote. They're actually creating a stringency index on which country is the most stringent. And um, the Indian uh, Prime Minister Modi said something on Twitter like, oh, look at that, Oxford um, government response trigger is giving us full points, the most stringent or something, we're the best. <laughs> and, then, and then the people from the um, tracker said, actually, that is not uh, about what is the best or the worst. It's just a, a stringency <laughs> index of, of uh, what restrictions are in place. So I think that was funny. But really seeing, and that's why I wanted to give that example, seeing something you do in, in the social sciences just by being affected, basically, what's happening around you, uh, keeping track of things and then kind of putting them uh, somewhere in a systematic way can have so much impact. Um, but I think for me, it was always interesting. And I think, Jan, um, that's maybe where my first question would actually go to see or to have that intersection kind of between academia and the practical relevance, right? And I think you're very much addressing that uh, through the think tank um, that I also had read about already um, before. Maybe you can say a little bit about your motivation to do that and to take it actually out of academia, to take research out of academia a little bit. Um, thanks. A great. It's a great example, by the way. I, I really love the, the the initiative that comes out of Blavatnik. It's great that you're you're involved with that. Um, I think it's 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 one of those really really useful um, things. Um, and and one thing that I really like um, about some of the initiatives that come out of this crisis is how. Um, basically, social science research is actively used externally, and it's it's becoming noticed and and you know workable. I think with um, the for me personally, the the core motivation was always I always wanted to engage externally. I always found it very difficult to imagine that I just do something for myself in a sense, and um, I found it really. F a lot of things are grown for me out of a frustration. Like when I see things and think this could be better, I think this is quite a common feeling. It's like, no, come on, that must be better. But very often we believe, and this is what Jakob's, um, my, my studies taught me a lot, often what I think would result in something better isn't what would result in something better. You know, that's where empirical research comes in. We ha all have ideas. We all have these conversations around the dinner table at a bar, well, not at a bar at the moment, but, you know, normally these, these sort of conversations where, oh, if we just did this, it works. And that's where research comes in, to give us not certainty, but answers and likelihoods of what might work better than other things. But the important thing is what questions are being asked. And one of the things that I've become very frustrated with is often that not the right questions are being asked in the debates because things sit within disciplinary debates. So I give you an example, not even think tank, right, but out of the university context even. And university researchers can have a real impact on this. So we had a debate in Scotland, so where I'm based, in uh, 2012. The Scottish independence referendum of 2014 was announced. And one of the things that was discussed immediately was uh, what would happen to the voting franchise. So who can vote? And they kept basically the same as for the Scottish Parliament elections, except for one change. They, lowered, they wanted to lower the voting age to 16 for that referendum. Normally it was 18 in Scotland. So I was interested in this. I wasn't in favor or against. I wanted to look at data around 16-year-old's political attitudes and behavior. We didn't have any data. There simply wasn't anything good qualitative or good quantitative data on this age group. So 16, 17 year olds, we have surveys on their sexual behavior, their drug taking and all these sorts of things, but we didn't have representative data on them because polling usually starts at 18. 
um, because that's where political parties have an interest and so on. So we got funding to do a project around it um, and actually collect the data and we were able to inform these debates and I then gave consultations to the Scottish Parliament and I was able to talk to the clerks, I was able to talk to politicians, campaigners, and our evidence was used quite widely to inform the debate. Subsequently, by the way, the voting age was lowered to 16 for all Scottish elections because the evidence suggested that all the fears people had weren't coming true, but at the same time, the impact was. But even before that, the, what I was frustrated while we were collecting the data and doing the good scientific thing of you know robust collections and getting into it, people were out there having debates about why it's a good or a bad idea to lower the voting age without looking at the data, but also not necessarily asking the right questions. So one of the big things that people were constantly saying was, well, look at 18 to 24 year olds. 18 to 24 year olds are voting less than older age cohorts. That's true in nearly every country in the Western world. 18 to 24 year olds have much lower voter participation. But the assumption was that would simply extrapolate down to 16, 17 year olds who would participate less which is, of yeah, course, the wrong approach to go about it. The fundamental question we should ask is, if 16, 17 year olds were allowed to participate politically, how, what would happen? Like, what would we be able to observe? We couldn't observe it yet because it hadn't happened. Um, so asking, like shifting the discussion, asking a different question in the first place, I think that is something academics can do. And when they do it, they can then surprise people with good research. And that gets me excited because I think we can then genuinely open up um, perspectives and minds, minds around some of these things. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, you, you were talking about um, frustrations a lot, right? Um, which I think is interesting because often you also hear that academics put out great research and have the numbers or uh, in-depth qualitative uh, case studies, let's say, um, but maybe at times it's also not really listened to, or it's now the debate even with the coronavirus, mm -hmm. right? Like academics are supposed to give one opinion and give like the easy solution, which obviously isn't out there. When, like under which circumstances do you kind of see politicians are most receptive to your research or your uh, results? And under what circumstances, maybe politically more biased or, or whatnot, um, would they rather be reluctant to taking any of your advice or, or any of your uh, data really? It's, it's, it's a really, really important question that you're asking there. I think it's, uh, it's, it's so important and often, um, often misunderstood. So very often when people talk about evidence, uh, um, you know, evidence-based policy making, all these sorts of things, people often talk about it in a, and I did in the past probably, in a very naive understanding. It's kind of, there's evidence and then some of it gets used and the politicians take it up and that's it. But obviously, evidence is incredibly political, right? Which evidence gets used, as you've described, you know, sometimes things gets picked up, get picked up and sometimes they don't. And there's a range of things that, that goes into this. It's um, so in Edinburgh, in our undergraduate program, we have a program called Government Policy and Society. It sounds a bit similar to some of the things that are being done at Jacobs. Um, we might have had some inspiration, uh, actually. And we have a course, actually, on evidence and how evidence impacts policy. And one of the most important things is that there isn't one pathway. Sometimes it's genuinely true. You sometimes have, you know, it's not always cynical. Sometimes you have politicians, civil servants, expert groups, and it's literally, here's a goal. We want to achieve this. What's the best way of doing it? And then there's a big kind of exercise in bringing it to. Sometimes that happens, but not always. Sometimes it's, here is a policy we want to implement, which evidence best supports that policy, of course. Um, but it's really, really varied. It's, it's, and we have very different experiences. You think once you do it for several years, you know how to do it. No, sometimes we're more successful and sometimes less successful. Um, and the reason for that is, is I think that elites, um, policymakers, politicians engage very differently with it. So I've worked on a few projects, research projects with colleagues where we looked at mass opinion and elite opinions and where the dissonances lie. For example, in the context of constitutional change in the UK, political values in Europe, um, views about the European Union. And one thing that's really interesting, so what we do actually in our research, we do public opinion surveys, and we take the research into our elite interviews and we present elites um, with the findings and then discuss. So we ask them, what do you think the publics think? Then we show them what they think, and then we see how they react. And the reactions fall broadly into three groups. There's one group that's genuinely the kind of what people, if you have a cynical view, would expect. It's like, no, 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 I don't care. I know better. Go away. There's one group, however, but that's not the biggest group. 
the biggest group is probably somewhere in between. It's like, huh, that's interesting. Um, but I'm challenging it also with my assumptions. So it's a dialogue actually that starts emerging. And then there's a third group, and that is the group that says, wow, I didn't know this. That is super interesting and strategically very useful for me actually. So they really want to adopt it potentially. But now different situations, I think, um, open themselves up for different of these kind of scenarios to play out in the aggregate, because then it's not just about one individual, but what's kind of the dominant discourse and where is the direction going in. And to gauge this is very difficult. So if you have, a, you need at least the middle group. If you have a group of elites that are happy to engage in a dialogue, you can. If you have people who pursue a strategic goal, then you want to frame it in terms of strategy. So we are currently working on a project on the climate crisis. And there, our goal is explicitly to try to find ways for all different political parties to find a way to use the same evidence in different ways, actually, because we think there are different discourses they can all engage with. Um, so it's directly attached to something more strategic. If you have the total rejection, however, then you don't engage with the policymakers. Then you, for example, engage with civil society groups that might be able to put pressure on those policymakers. So what you do is you use your evidence to enable other groups that have much more influence on public opinion formation, for example, and you pass it on. So sometimes the best way to affect policy is not through the policymakers at all, but by taking your evidence to other groups that can shape public opinion or go through journalists and so on. So the strategy, there isn't kind of, there's sometimes these books of the one strategy towards. I think most of that's absolute rubbish. The, the fundamental point is that it really can work through different pathways and sometimes an interplay of, of different pathways. So I think it's an excellent question and something that we often don't think about critically enough. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then maybe if, if it's okay, I would like to now move yeah, uh, the talk towards a more pragmatic uh, perspective, because that's also an important question for anybody who is right now first year almost done. You're thinking about what does social science mean to me? And one of the things is, will I be able to feed my children? Uh, uh, or is it an irresponsible choice? My parents invested in me and now I'm doing social science. I'll tell you what I encounter very often is like, well, uh, and I'll give you a practical example from my family. I have one branch of my family is in Canada, actually in Vancouver, and um, they're very practical people. Like my cousin actually built a house on an island um, uh, with his own hands and all the, the uh, tables and stuff inside he, he made. Uh, he's a cameraman and he he's a sportsman. He 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 does trick skiing or did I don't know whether he still does it, and was one of the first handy like the steady cam cameramen. So he's like um, upward, downwards, forward, sideward. He is a practical person, and his comment was, "Wait, you can actually make a living by just talking and thinking." <laughs> And that is, I think, the mindset of most people uh, when they think of social sciences is like, yeah, it sounds like interesting. I'm easily convinced from that, but can you actually make a living from that? Mm -hmm. Now, I must say from the first thing that Jan said, and this is actually also my life experience, is if you can't say how many hours you worked per day, you can't say what your hourly pay is. So the idea of maximizing the amount of money you make per hour work you invest goes right out of the window when you lose the distinction between doing what you love and loving what you do. And um, that might be a problem, but then at the end of the day, or more precisely at the end of the month or year or lifetime, there's also like, okay, a balance, did I do well? Now, this is my question. I don't know whether it's, I didn't ask you previously whether it's okay to ask you, but what, what, what kind of a living is that? Being a social scientist, can you, should you warn us? <laughs> don't do that unless you're a fanatic. 
No, no, no. I think, I think, I think it's a very good question. And that's basically the question my parents asked me when I was 16 and told them about this. They were like, okay, yes, you know, having this in mind that I would be, you know, a famous physicist or something like this. Um, and then I was like, so the, they asked me, like verbatim, basically, the, it was, so can you earn money with this? Um, so it's in a, in a very practical way. Um, well, first, on the very pragmatic side, um, the answer is simply is yes. Um, yeah. And and if I look at the people who I've studied with, um, yeah, I don't know anyone who doesn't. They do it through very different pathways. So some people like me went down an academic pathway, but look, at I'm doing academics, but I'm also doing like something that is, you know, slightly less academic and much more applied. I've done some consult. I'm doing, I'm a consultant to the European Commission um, on a project at the moment. I've done polling for the Green Party in British Columbia in Canada, so around Vancouver, um, which happened for another Jacobs alumni who was their campaign director. And they were looking for someone who could do polling for them more cheap. So I've been designing that question. So, you know, strange things happen sometimes through Jacobs connections. Um, but so I'm, yes, I'm academic, but I work also on consultancy, for example. Then there are other um, graduates who directly went explicitly into consultancy, and a lot of them are obviously also very good money. Um, but there are others who, um, so one of the people I studied with, for, so some people work for government, so civil service is obviously an obvious route. But just to show the diversity, I think also, um, I know people who went into law schools afterwards and uh, one of the people I know who afterwards went and now works for a trade union as their lawyer, but so has the social science background understanding kind of the context, but so it's not just an abstract legal approach, so combining kind of social legal questions, but also um, uh, a friend of mine, Mexico, who um, is, is a business person, um, set up um, businesses but businesses that deal with social problems. Um, I wouldn't call, they're not social enterprise or, or so, but they are um, focusing, for example, on alternative ways of thinking about care. So classically, there's often these kind of retirement villages and communities, but they were looking at, well, actually, people's life circumstances change when they get older. Actually, sometimes pro you might not need just one change in later life, but multiple changes. The, in, the community is built around loads of different types of accommodation that you can move within the community easily in between within that model. Um, so bringing social things into business context as well. So there are many, many different pathways. This sort of academic pathway that I'm in is, is not the only one. And we have people who work for international organizations as well in the UN Food and Agricultural Organizations program, for example. So there really, really is quite a lot of diversity um, there of what you can do. Um, I think the, there's one challenge though, and that it's what brings with it. There isn't this kind of one pathway. So you have to chart that pathway yourself. So you can't get a degree in social sciences and think career sorted, basically. It is something that you have to make active choices about. Try out things. It doesn't have to be linear. It can wobble a bit. I said I didn't go down the path in the sense I expected to go down when I started. Um, but you have to make these choices and, and really embrace them, try things out and be proactive about them. But I find that exciting um, because it allows you to find something that really suits you with this background. It is applicable to a lot of really exciting things. That involves frustrations along the way when things that you think would be awesome don't work out, but you're flexible enough to change them. And that's the most important thing. Um, it's a good idea to make plans, but that's one thing that I would say for myself. It's really important to be not blasé about it, but to be willing to give up on some of those plans again, to be willing to move away from them. And, and if you think that something better works, um, that you explore something through it. I think that's that's really crucial. But if you can do it, I think it's 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 a great thing. It's it's a really, really great thing because you can find something that you can connect to your life more broadly. Thank you, Jan. Finn, speaking of which, uh, when are you graduating? What's your next step? Do you have plans you will then not realize? Or uh, <laughs> what's your future look like? Let's see. Tell that's your future question, self right? what you're going to do. And we'll oh, check on wow. you next, like in in a couple of years, <laughs> we'll do this, redo this interview, and you'll right. be the old guy. That's, pardon me, yeah, I'm the old guy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and you'll have some young student who's just like uh, finishing, I don't know, uh, Oxford again, and, uh, and he'll ask you questions. So what, what, what will you be doing? 
Well, um, I, I, first of all, I think, I think that's really um, an important question, and it, it's something that you have to get used to kind of not knowing exactly what you want to do, I guess, for most people doing the social sciences, and especially, I think, with, um, at least that, that's what it was for me with ISS, I was interested in so many things, and I feel like with Jan, also the things you were talking about now, um, having really a broad kind of array of disciplines and being having different things we're interested in and so forth can also make it really difficult to focus on something, right? Um, and so my next plans, I mean, I'm also, I don't know whether um, it will be academia necessarily in the end. It's still something, I think, um, which is also not that easy to plan, especially since it's a very competitive uh, job market as well. Um, it used to be a very nice guaranteed uh, job probably with tenure track and so forth. Uh, that's not really the reality anymore, especially, long time, long time. Uh, I guess, in the long yeah, a long time ago, especially in the beginning to get started in academia and so on. Um, but I think it's, it's really, what Jan said is really good advice to try out as many things as possible. And I think with social sciences, it's um, sometimes difficult to show exactly what skills we kind of learned, right? And to market those skills, to sell them in a way. But also at Jacobs, I feel like there are so many things that you can get involved in, and probably most of you are. Like, I don't know, some event organization or you're teaching Sorry, did I quite special think we have a problem? Yeah, fit, just hold on a second. Garbage. I think the, the, just just one second. I'll um, let's just try and reset. Okay, Finn, give it another try. Oh, did it? Did I cut out? Ah, good. Yeah, but I think you're back. I think you're back. Um, so right. we we had you. I think we had you roughly until the point where you were you were talking at Jacobs. There are a lot of opportunities for things to try out. That's that's when you cut out. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think um, that's that's really um, one of the best things about Jakobs, I think, that really during your free time as well, I mean, you're maybe kind of stuck on campus, which can also have its downsides, but um, there's so many things you can try out for um, social enterprises, or, or I don't know, I was involved, let's say, with the Jakobs startup competition, or is it me? Okay, I think we got the idea. I will cut you short there. Yeah. Because uh, your connection, your side, uh, uh, Flensburg is uh, is giving in, and I think uh, also um, the general idea of what you're say, saying is 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 quite clear and and interesting to to our audience. Uh, let me. Um, uh, just comment on what Jan said. I found it rather indecent to see that uh, the alumni, uh, on average, make more money than I do. The alumni of ISS uh, are all above 3,000 net per month, euro, which is roughly what I make. Not a big secret. Uh, this is after taxes, um, what I have, bar kralle, we say in German. Um, and most of ISS alumni make more than I do. I think that's an insult. I should be making more than my students, but I'm not. Um, and um, I must say that does not make me unhappy. I think I have a, I have a good balance of I, I really do what I enjoy and love. So that's part of my pay in a sense, but it is a reasonable, sensible choice of, for my life path. So it was okay. I did have quite uh, some stretches of really insecure situation that I never worried about. That was my personality type. Um, when uh, I was looking for a job for, I think, a half a year was my maximum. Um, but it never really made me unhappy. So uh, I could live with that, and uh, I must say that is only for the, the purely academic path and somebody who apps explicitly never made any strategic choices, but just read whatever they found interesting and studied whatever kind of, you know, seemed at the moment just to fascinate me. So I, I had my maximum share of fun in terms of what I studied, 
not maybe the maximum uh, buck I could have made out of it. I think you two might be a bit smarter in those choices because it's not a mistake to be strategic about that. But uh, at the end of the day, even the most irresponsible person like me um, does, does well. And I think that is, even to me actually, is a, is a kind of a surprise that even I am a bit victim to the stereotypes of, yeah, there's no money in that. But at the end of the day, at the end of the year, at the end of hopefully, hopefully not my lifetime, but you know, a couple of decades into social science, I must say, no, it's, a, it's an okay choice. I mean, I'm not rich, obviously, but I'm doing totally okay and I do what I love. So there you have if, it. If you and there are I, other guys. I, yes, go ahead. Just, just to come in, I think it's also, it is a really important question that you don't need to answer that, I think. That's the important thing. You don't need to answer that necessarily when you're 20 and kind of how much money do you want or need to earn. Um, there are certain steps, obviously, where path dependencies develop, but that is a bit later. I know people who've um, started in academia and moved into consultancy in much higher positions than they otherwise would, and vice versa. I know people who've started in um, the private sector, for example, or a good friend and colleague um, who started in marketing research and moved into academia um, later on. Um, so that, I think there are a lot of different pathways, and it's a it's a valid question. What kind of um, living standards should you have? I think. The important bit is not, the most important thing I had to learn for myself is to not evaluate yourself against some abstract metric that someone else might be setting for you. So don't fall into, I would say a trap of saying, I need to maximize my income as much as I can, unless you want to, if that's the most important thing, go for it. But similarly, don't fall into the trap of someone saying, you should never work during the weekend. It's terrible. It's if your life, if you ever work more than eight hours a day, then clearly you've made, did something wrong in your life. Um, and, and the most important thing is, you know, some abstract notion of work life. But now for you, that might be really important because that's how you like to live. And that's, you have other things, you're engaged in the community in other ways, totally separate from your work and you need to create that space, um, for example. Um, so I, I think it's really important to explore this as, as over over the next years of, of your life. Think about what is the material standard you need and uh, what is the engagement I want? What are the relations I want? What's the place I want to live in? Um, and, and find a good balance. Try to find a good balance um, behind it. Um, and the final thing about it is that's something I try, I'm, I'm grappling with all the time because once you are on a trajectory, it is easy to fall into the trap, you know, if, if people get promoted around you to think, oh, I need to get that as well and those sorts mm -hmm. of things. And, and you might, you might be much great if you want to do that, but it's, it's classic stuff from happiness research. So I think the Brockman would be very happy uh, for me mentioning this. Um, but um, so by, by the way, my final year was the first year where that course was taught, the happiness research course. Uh, so um, that's that's where some of that inspiration comes from. But it's really important that sometimes evaluate is what you have actually exactly what makes you happy at that moment. And if it is, then maybe don't focus on enhancing that thing. Enjoy what you have as long as you keep enjoying it. If you don't enjoy it anymore, that's a point to do. And that's easily said, but actually very <laughs> Because we tend to think of the future rather than trying to see kind of what we like about the present. Um, I think that's that's maybe also because we often talk about the change of the future. But as you do this, sometimes think about the present and whether your current situation is actually um, ideal for you. And in that case, um, maybe stick with it for a while. Okay, Jan, you absolutely stole uh, my role as the old guy <laughs> who's supposed to say the wise words. So that was a wonderful way to conclude our talk. I think uh, I will <laughs> take your advice. To that. <laughs> I think that's something I can, can full heartedly end with as as the statement of this this meeting of this talk. That something that's something that really we want to convey to other people. Wonderful. I'm happy we had this conversation. Final comments from you, Tim. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know whether, uh, yeah, but um, just saying that since we were talking about path dependencies in the beginning so much, um, I think at that point, you can really all uh, know that you haven't closed off a lot of uh, doors yet, like there are still many things to go into. So 
as much as having kind of the insecurity of where you're going to go to, uh, I think you also have that beauty of really still having a choice. And social sciences can and probably will always play a role in your lives. Uh, but there are so many yeah, things to pursue or pathways to go down to. And you have really still all the choices in the world. Well, and, and again, I must say, that's my text, bastard. <laughs> <laughs> really wise words. I thank you guys for taking your time to give pass on some, some uh, experiential knowledge to the younger generation of students who follow in your footsteps, so to say, or maybe not. Um, and and I th I'm really happy about this conversation because it turns out also that I come out of the talk as somehow with the feeling that uh, this was valuable to me and meaningful to me. Um, um, I also love to see, like, Finn, ex ex of course, you are your own product, but I like to imagine that I've meddled a bit in, in, uh, <laughs> in producing the Finn Kleber who says such wise, wise words of advice to, to uh, the next generation of social science students. So wonderful. Um, age does not necessarily cascade. We can switch around roles and, and have really meaningful results. Thank you for this wonderful talk and goodbye. Thanks for having us. Thank you.